It's great to be here. And in fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, when Jan asked me to give this uh, lecture, um, he, he, he made it quite a challenge for me. I thought, OK, so I will, I will uh, go in, in my box and, and put up some slides about, uh, about the place of vaporizers and things like that. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I sent my presentation to Jan. I said, well, that's not really what I want. I really want that you dig into your data and that you, you come up really with the answer um, when I inject a, pro, a bolus of propofol at the beginning um, um, uh, to induce my patient, and I would like to continue with inhaled anesthetics, when should I open my vaporizer? Honestly, that's quite a challenging question to answer mathematically. Um, so I, uh, I started uh, with my group to, to look around to the data we had in our laboratory and uh, luckily I, I will have the possibility to present the answer to you today with, with some new stuff. So uh, I'm only the captain of the team and I have to acknowledge all the people uh, working uh, both in, in Groningen. Uh, some of uh, those people were already named uh, with papers they published by, by previous speakers. We have uh, a lively uh, communication link with the Bern University, also with the Ghent University. We work with people from Switzerland, uh, now stationed in Basel. And I have to declare a conflict of interest. We also have a very um, good collaboration with the engineering team from Drager Medical. Um, they support our drug interaction group and um, we also collaborate with them, um, both in practical but absolutely also in a theoretical, mathematical way, uh, in the development of the uh, smart pilot view. So, what are the goals of anesthesia? That's what we should ask ourselves every time we induce a patient to go asleep. Well, the goals of anesthesia are simply to provide accurate induction and maintenance of anesthesia, uh, providing homeostasis, covering hypnosis, immobility, and uh, neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular blocking agents might also add something to that uh, immobilization. And of course, we also want in that hemostasis hemodynamic um, stability, the total hemostasis. But afterwards, we also want to provide a quick response to a rapid change during the perioperative um, changes. So, so your patient falls asleep. And then the, the surgeon uh, enters the room and he starts creating like an, another universum. It's a universum with a stimulus. And that's another one. So you have to cover that. So you have to, to go from homeostasis 1 to homeostasis 2. That's another challenge. These are, for me as a clinician, the two situations in anesthesia where I have to play around with the concentrations of my drugs. And for today, because that was Jan's question, let's focus on the first one. Optimizing hemodynamic stability for me is a reduction of the valley of no anesthesia after an IV induction. Jan, is that the question you would like to see answered? Yeah, okay. I'm lucky. <laughs> so we need an adequate hypnotic drug delivery and therefore we have to seek for the correct time course of that drug delivery. Enrico already in his presentation gave us some clues by showing us the Judah Plumber example, and that's a very good starting point. So let's focus on that first 10 minutes of our anesthesia case. We start with a bolus of propofol. That's what I s tell you here. We start with a bolus of propofol, and we want to continue with inhaled anesthetics. That's I think worldwide, the most common way of delivering anesthesia. And on top of that, of course, you give your analgesics, uh, opiates or local uh, block or whatever, and if required, a neuromuscular blocking agent. That's that valley of no anesthesia. My propofol is fading away after the induction. And um, uh, if, if you have a strong nursing power in your OR that don't want to be polluted with inhaled anesthetics, you know the story, then you have a problem. Because you don't dare anymore to open your vaporizer because uh, there might be some pollution and you don't open that vaporizer before you have intubated the patient, sealed everything for that pollution. But it might take some minutes, depending on the neuromuscular blocking agent you're using. That's that valley of no anesthesia. Now the question is, how large is this valley? Do we understand that valley? Yes, do we know how large is this? Probably not. So, you have to know your pharmacology for that. 
And again, I have to refer to what Rick told us because that is real the clinical practice. You have to know the time to peak effect of your drugs. You have to know the offset profile of your drugs and you have to know how your drugs work together. If you know these three things, you can play around with the administration of your drug. When do you give the drug? How much do you give the drug? In which combination to avoid the onset of that valley of no anesthesia? Please realize that most of the reported awareness cases are happening in that period. Patient remembering, feeling being intubated. So it's a dangerous zone and it's our task to optimize our drug delivery. Time to peak effect is one of the first things you have to know. And if you give, again, I have to, to go back to the previous presentation, Wait, wait, wait. If you give a bolus of sufentanil, the time to peak effect of sufentanil is 5.4 minutes. So you should teach your, teach your residents that they have to wait for that 5.4 minutes because that's the, way, that's the time it takes to have the onset. For fentanyl, it's 3.6. For remifentanil and all fentanyl, it's around 1.5 minutes. So this is the, the way you should give the drug and wait for the effect. Time to peak effect. Equilibration times. We all know that the plasma, that's the compartment where we inject our drugs, the blood or the plasma is not the site of drug action. It's outside of that blood compartment. It's in what we call in pharmacology the biophase or an effect site compartment. And it takes some time. In pharmacology we call that hysteresis. And that hysteresis depends from drug to drug. Thiopental, the T half KO, that's the equilibration time, it's 1.2 minutes. For propofol, it's around 1.6. Midazolam is much slower, around 4. You find these numbers in the literature. But as a clinician, when you inject a drug, you should know this. So these numbers are important. So what I did for you to, answer, to start answering Jan's question is give a bolus of propofol. And I assimilated the plasma concentration and the effect site concentration of a bolus of 2 mg per kilogram propofol given in 60 seconds. Honestly, in clinical practice, that's already slow. But this is how you should do it. But honestly, we do it faster. Propofol, 2 mg per kilogram, 60 seconds. Male, 45 years, 70 kg. Perfect body shape, one, uh, 170 centimeters. And this is how it looks. Okay? Um, please note that the effect site concentration for 95% of your population having a loss of consciousness when you use the Schneider model is 5.4 micrograms per milliliter. So you clearly see that around two minutes, my red line, that's the effect site concentration, is at its highest point. Okay. Now my patient falls asleep. Let's estimate that, that I've given my remifentanil a couple of minutes before and it's in steady state. Or I've given my sufentanil 5.4 minutes before and it's on its maximum effect. Okay. Now my patient falls asleep and I inject my neuromuscular blocking agent. If I use rocuronium, roughly said, after two minutes, I'm ready for intubation. If I use cisatracurium, I can add another roughly two minutes. So you see what's happening with my propofol effect site concentration at that time. At um, two minutes, at my maximum level, I'm around, with that two milligrams per kilogram, I'm around seven. That's above 5.4. So I'm theoretically okay. Two minutes later, I'm around 5.2. So I'm becoming a little bit lower to become in the lower zone, but still okay. Around 92% of my population will still be okay. Of course, after four minutes, it will be around three, which is in the danger zone. So I have to know this. I have to know the time course of my effect site concentration. Now, this is what we studied a couple of years ago, and one of the previous speakers mentioned uh, this article already. So, we asked ourselves the questions, do we need inhaled anesthetics to blunt arousal hemodynamic responses to intubation after IV induction with propofol, remifentanil, and rocuronium? Um, we started with the remifentanil, as I, I, I told you, remifentanil TCI, uh, 2 nanograms per milliliter, 3 minutes before induction. 
then you are in pseudo steady state when you start your propofol. Propofol was given in a manual way, 600 milliliters per hour until loss of consciousness. We gave a rocuronium bolus and we randomized our patients to one MAC desflurane at lock. Um, no desflurane at lock, but only after the intubation and one MAC sevoflurane after loss of consciousness uh, or, or only when the patient was intubated. So we had four groups. Okay, so these are the results. And you see that um, the uh, upper screen, and I have to be careful, I, I saw already with the previous speakers. Here are the BIS values. The BIS values, you see that in all groups, you have a rise in your, in your, uh, in your groups at intubation. So with this regimen, I was not able to blunt, whatever I did, to blunt the rise in BIS completely. With desflurane, I did a better job than with sevoflurane because we know that desflurane is a little bit faster than sevoflurane. If I only started the sevoflurane and the desflurane after the intubation, we saw that it was still okay. But we had a little bit a more arousability, but not to endanger the patient. Why? Because we gave rocuronium and uh, 120 seconds after loss of consciousness, we intubated the patient. And the patient was still above that 5.4 5 micrograms per milliliter in the effect site concentration. So this study showed that you had some hemodynamic changes, some arousability, but not to wake up the patient. We didn't do this study with cisatercurium, but I'm pretty sure if we would have waited for four minutes, we would have been in the dangerous zone. So this triggered Jan and me when we started discussing this, like, okay, but we have to do better. Um, for Again, for political reasons, it's hard to, in some ORs, to give inhaled anesthetics by, by mask ventilation, so we have to do better. And this is what it says here in the, um, in the study. Now you have to be careful, uh, and I said the cave here, of course the amount of opiates given in front, if you give a ton of opiates, you will enlarge your window a little bit uh, before you become in, 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 you come in the danger zone. It's a blunting effect. And of course, in this study, we gave no additional bolus of propofol before the intubation. Now, if you give a bolus of propofol, and I think I did that here for you, I gave a second bolus of propofol because all clinicians in the room will say now, why do you make things so complicated? Just give another bolus of propofol and then intubate the patients. So that's what I did here. So, um, I did the two milligrams per kilogram in 60 seconds, and after 240 seconds, I give an additional 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram. So I get a, a, a second bump here. And this might work. But then please realize that it takes 1.6 minutes before that second bolus has arrived and the maximum peak effect has been reached. So you should give the bolus and wait another 1.6 minutes. And then it might be okay. I enlarged that, that, that previous slide a little bit, and you clearly see that, that this is doing well. You stay out of the danger zone, you stay about five. So one of the possibilities to make it very easy to minimize that valley of no anesthesia is to give an additional bolus. Of course, an additional bolus might also induce some additional hemodynamic side effects, etc., etc., and it's still not quantified. So I was with this, simulation, I was still not able to answer the young question, because he really wanted to know at what moment should I open my vaporizer? Is it at 240 seconds, at 330, at 420? Um, and what is my rising time? How fast should it increase? Because my propofol, whatever I do with these propofol boluses, it will come down. So when one comes down, the other, way, uh, the other one has to come up. So how should I do this? Mathematically. Um, I will skip this one for time reasons. So, again, be careful because you also have to know what your opiates are doing on top of that. And you have to know the combined potency of your drugs. <coughs> and to answer Jan's question, I had to step back to the interaction pharmacology. And this is also what is in Smart Pilot View and Navigator. But I will just give you an example how you can use these things uh, not only to become a professor, but also to use it in your clinical practice. Because there are hypnotic-hypnotic drug interactions, 
and there are hypnotic opiate interactions. And this is what we studied in these drug interaction studies. So propofol and sevoflurane is a hypnotic-hypnotic drug interaction. And on top of that, as we all do, we gave some remifentanil. We also did it in the Coppens study. So with that, you have a hypnotic opiate drug interaction. So in fact, you have to deal with three, and if you add nitrous oxide, with four drug interactions. It makes things quite complicated. So what do we have? What is available? This kind of studies are available. This is from uh, Peter Siebel's group, who uh, published that the interaction of propofol uh, and sevoflurane, a loss of consciousness and movement, is additive. Clearly additive here. This is not a drug interaction study uh, using surface interaction modeling. So we enlarged that. We took it from there with our group. And um, this is the first one we studied. It's the interaction between propofol and sevoflurane. And we found that there is an additive uh, interaction. Propofol and sevoflurane adds interactively. That's easy, because then you can stay on one axis. It goes up and down. That's easy. So you're on your y-axis here, and you stay on your y-axis. Thomas Bouillon groups uh, in uh, Steve Schaefer's laboratory at Stanford, he did all the intravenous work. He had done the interaction between propofol and remifentanil. And he built an hierarchical model on that. And um, Thomas proved, I think I have a slide on that. Uh, yeah, he proved, and you see it clearly here, that these drug interactions are synergistic for the uh, dichotomous responses. I mean tolerance to shake and shout, tolerance to laryngoscopy, tolerance to LMA insertion. Not on the continuous ones. If you do surface modeling on BIS, you will see a total other picture. In fact, it might turn out to become nearly additive. Why? Because BIS and analgesic measurements doesn't work well together. It's only giving you information on your hypnotic component. So if you use it to do a drug interaction on propofol um, remifentanil, you might, add, uh, you might end up with an additive model due to the fact that it doesn't measure it very, quite well. But that's another story. So keep, keep with Jan's question. Okay. This is the information we had in our data library. So we have already propofol sevoflurane, we have propofol um, remifentanil, and of course you can, um, uh, with, with sevoflurane you can go to desflurane, with remifentanil you can go to all the, all the, the other opiates because there is a an, an, uh, quantifier uh, um, mathematical solution for that. Okay, the next one, which was lacking in the literature a couple of years ago, was a study on, um, I will skip this one, the next one, this one, is sevoflurane remifentanil. We didn't have inhaled with opiates. And there were two groups, in fact, Dwayne Westing, where is Dwayne? Dwayne Westing's gov, Dwayne, you did one, and we did one, and we, we, we bo both our groups, independent from each other, found that it's working synergistically, both on the hypnotic component and the analgesic component. Now, what was interesting in all our studies, both from uh, the Utah group, both from uh, the Stanford group, both from our group, is that we used nearly similar dichotomous measurements, being tolerance to laryngoscopy or incision or something like that. And in all the studies we did and Thomas did, we used the tolerance to laryngoscopy, PTOL, the probability of tolerating a laryngoscopy. And all clinicians among you will know that this is quite a strong stimulus. So if the patient is not responding to that one, you're pretty safe. So remember, you, you want your patient, and this is the, the laryngoscopy interaction, this one. So you want to be here. This is said before. So to answer Jan's question, with whatever you use as drug combination, to minimize your value of no anesthesia, you want to stay here. No tolerance to laryngoscopy, independent from the combined uh, amount of drugs you're using. So this one, or the P90 or better. So this is what you find in the Smart Pilot view and also in the Navigator. These isoballs, representation is a little bit different in the both systems, but you want to stay above this isoball. And then you don't have that, in theory, no value of, anest uh, no, value of no anesthesia. 
So this is how it is represented in the uh, smart pilot view. And this is how it is represented in the navigator. And this is how you have to quantify it. This is PTOL. And PTOL is the probability of tolerance to laryngoscopy. And in fact, you're, I'm quite happy to tell you that you got the world premiere of this uh, work because what we did, and we will present it at EASA within three weeks, we took all the studies, um, both Thomas Bouillon's group's work, uh, the group from our group's work, Sevoflurane, Propofol, Propofol, Remifantanil, Sevoflurane, Remifantanil, and the addition or no addition of nitrous oxide, and we put it all together. So we remodeled everything, and it just came out of the laboratory. And so with this one, I can tell you, and I can in fact merge both worlds of inhaled anesthesia and intravenous anesthesia using PTOL. And this was um, still not possible, and Rick showed it in his presentation, when you use intravenous, when you use PTOL on the smart pilot view, and when, you use, when you're in the inhaled world, you have to switch to MAC. With this one, it's not required anymore. So with this one, you merge everything. And you can choose PTOL for everything or MAC for everything. Okay? So to answer Jan's question, how fast does it have to rise, I could use this formula. The U is your unit function is the concentration of sevoflurane divided by the C50 for that population, plus the effect site concentration you have in your patient at that moment, divided by the population C50, it's a plus in that formula because it's additive, multiplied by something synergistically, meaning the, uh, the effect site concentration of remifentanil divided by the C50 of that population, um, and powered by the gamma. The gamma is the slope of your curve. With this U, you can design that complete surface model. Okay? And PTOL is a function of U, and in fact the NSRI is a function of PTOL. But I will not go so far. So let's stay with PTOL, because that's perhaps a little bit easier. So if I can answer Jan's question, I have to know at every time of drug combinations if my PTOL stays about 0 0.95, 95% 95 of my population will not respond to a laryngoscopic stimulation. So let's do that. Go back to my, my Judah plumber. I have um, the equal 0 0.95, my simulation. I started training fentanyl uh, and I waited until the steady state. And then I give a bolus, 2 milligram per kilogram in 60 seconds. And I give an additional bolus of 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram after 240 seconds. Okay? And then I ask, um, I ask myself the question, to answer Jan's question, when do I have to open my vaporizer? When am I coming in the danger zone? Okay, here we are. So, um, this is my propofol. Can you understand me without microphone? Um, this is the, the blue line is my propofol from the previous slide. This is the effect side concentration of propofol. This is my PTOL at any, any time, okay? So I start my propofol, my patient will go to a very, let's say, deep level of combined anesthetic um, characteristics. My PTOL is very high, nearly 100% will tolerate at the maximum effect site concentration of propofol with that big bolus, will tolerate that laryngoscopy with 2 nanograms of uh, 2 nanograms uh, of per milliliter remifentanil in steady state, okay? All right, and then that's my bolus. And if I do that, I have to open my vaporizer after 240 seconds. The population mean model. It's prediction, folks. Please realize it's prediction. After 240 seconds, my PTOL will reach the 0 0.95. And then I have to do something, because then my propofol will fade away, and I will enter the dangerous zone. So, Jan, it's 240 seconds. Okay? Um, the yellow line is the effect side concentration of propofol. And Duane, in his presentation, said, wouldn't it be great if we have that effect side, that brain concentration, in our machines? People from the industry, please do it. I would love to have a machine with effect side concentration of inhaled anesthetics. We have it passively calculated already in Navigator and Spark Pilot View. We, we can't do TCI with effect side controlled sevoflurane. The best we can do 
external round arm vaporizer or inject at the entitle level. This is the yellow line, and Jan, you have to deal now in your lecture, how do I cover that this goes in the right way? How do I have to play with my machine and tube and whatever you are, you are good in to, to have that yellow line following that time course? So this is the answer, 240. If I add a bolus of 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram, I have a little bit more time. Makes sense as a clinician. 330 seconds. So that second bolus before the intubation really helps. If I don't want to give, a, for whatever reason, a second bolus, I have to give more remifentanil in the beginning. Because if I give remifentanil 4 nanograms per milliliter, plus a bolus of propofol uh, of um, 2, I give another bolus, I'm sorry. Then I add some more seconds. So if I have a 4 nanogram per, per milliliter remifentanil and I do a bolus of 2 milligram per kilogram plus the 0 0.5, the combined additive effect, then the PTOL will only reach the 0 0.95 after 420 seconds. Otherwise, I'm above. So to summarize, I think this is a good summary slide. It depends on the combination of drugs you're giving. So, and this is where we had the debate on, the amount of opiates you're giving on front of your hypnotics really helps you because it's a synergistic interaction. So these things really come, um, come all together and that's my conclusion. Oh, perfect, then I won't have to ask you to come to a conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> that's a lot. Awesome.